Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in this afternoon, and uh, my, we've just got the room about full today. We appreciate so many of you are in for the first time. For those of you joining us out in television, we are always like to be thanking you over and over for your prayers, your letters, as well as your financial help. And uh, we appreciate that so many of you just pass it on to others and give them our time of broadcasting and so forth. So we just praise the Lord for every part of it. Well, we're just a Bible study, and we're going to come right in and take up where we left off in our last taping, since this is the first program of these for this afternoon. We're going to go right back to Daniel chapter 7, and you'll remember that verse 14 was where we kicked off and spent almost two, three, four programs on the kingdom. And the reason I do that is that so many church people all across the whole spectrum of denominations know nothing of this thousand-year glorious heaven-on-earth kingdom. It's just they don't know what it's all about. And so that's what we did the last several programs. So now we're going to continue on after just hitting verse 14 for a kickoff verse and pick up verse by verse in Daniel chapter 7 again. All right, so where we left off, verse 14, there was given him. Now remember, this is all part of a vision that Daniel had had. And in that vision, he saw all this, that there was given him, that is God the Son, a dominion and glory and a kingdom. That's why we kicked off and had all those references then on this coming earthly kingdom. And not only would it be a kingdom, but that all people and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom. Now remember I stopped and said, what does a kingdom involve? A king, a people, and a land. That, that's three prerequisites for having a kingdom, and he's going to have it all, see? All right, and it'll be an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. All right, now we'll go on from there and drop down into verse 15, where now Daniel has come away from this vision experience, and he says, I was grieved in my spirit and in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. You know what I think he had? He had a migraine. <laughs> he had a headache after all of these revelations. Now, I always have to repeat and repeat and repeat. Don't just read this as some kind of a myth or a legend, because all through Israel's history, the supernatural was commonplace. And so for someone like Daniel to have these visions, one right after the other, it's not just a figment of someone's imagination. They were real. This was how God was dealing with his covenant people. All right, so after seeing these visions now, not only of the coming world empire, and we're going to come back to them now in verse 17, but also of this glorious throne room experience where he saw God the Son standing before God the Father, and with the admonition then that he would one day be king of kings and lord of lords. All right. So verse 16, I came near unto one of them that stood by, and that has to be an angel. And I asked him, this angel, the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know or understand the interpretation of the things. Verse 17, now here we come to a recap again of his vision that he experienced up there in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, and so forth. All right, these great beasts. Now, always remember that when either the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel or even Ezekiel, when they speak of these beasts, they're speaking of empires. And then, of course, the beast of all beasts will be the Antichrist and his rule over those final seven years. So don't picture some humongous, horrible-looking animal, even though it is depicting wild animals, yet it's an empire. It's a government, see? All right, verse 17. These great empires, depicted as beasts, and there are four of them, and they are four kings who will be heading up these four Gentile empires. Now, just... For a second, turn back to the first part of the chapter, still in chapter 7, 
and we'll just hit them briefly. Daniel 7, back to verse 4. The first was like a lion, see, a carnivorous killing animal. And it was also given eagle's wings. Well, an eagle is pretty good at ripping flesh. And then you come down to verse 5, the next empire after Babylon, which was the Mede and Persian, and it too is pictured as a carnivorous beast, but it's a bear. And you can see it's carnivorous because what does it have in its mouth? Three ribs. See, it's a meat-eating animal. All right, then you come down a little further, verse 6, after this, after the Median Empire passed away, what overtook it? The Greek Empire, Alexander the Great. And it was pictured as a leopard. Well, the reason Alexander the Great is always pictured as something that moves fast and quick is because his conquests were so rapid. He, he was able to shave off hundreds of miles by taking daring detours and so forth, and uh, he was almost reckless, and yet his recklessness always paid off. So there will be several references even now today through the speed of Alexander's conquest. All right, so here he's likened to a leopard, which had on the back of it four wings of a fowl, depicting the four generals that would take over his empire, and we'll be looking at that in a little bit. And then verse 7, here comes the fourth empire, which was in the first go-around, the Roman Empire. And it was dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth, it devoured and broke in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse. It was different from all the other beasts and before it. And then you come to the revived Roman Empire at the end of the age with the ten horns. So here we have the four empires that were Gentile in nature, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Now let's just go back because everybody needs review. Come back to Daniel chapter 2 and we'll see that in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, which of course Daniel interpreted, you have the same four empires, but here they're depicted as beautiful metal composed statue or an image of a man. And you can just picture this out there in that Middle Eastern sun. Down in verse 31 of chapter 2, same four empires, but described differently. Verse 31, Daniel is interpreting. He said, Thou, O king, sawest, behold, a great image or likeness of a man. The brightness was excellent standing before thee, and the form thereof was frightening, I think, because of its shimmering beauty. Now, here it was. The image's head was made of gold. The breast and shoulders was made of silver. Now, can you picture that in a bright sunlight day? That gold and silver, and then the third part, the belly area, was brass. My, just imagine how that would just shimmer in that noonday Middle Eastern sun. And then as he went on down through the torso, the legs were of iron, and then the feet part iron and part clay. All right, now then. Those four Gentile empires, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar in about 606 B.C., now come back to Luke 21, because this is the way I like to teach. This is the way I prefer to do it, it is not just stay in one chapter, which sometimes I have to, but in this case I can jump you all the way up to Luke chapter 21 and tie it together. Luke 21, and we'll just drop in at verse 20. Luke 21, verse 20. Now, this is during Christ's earthly ministry. So, if you have a red letter edition, it's in red. The Lord is speaking. He's speaking prophetically. Now, He's not talking about the tribulation and Armageddon. He's talking about the 70 A.D. destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Okay? Luke 21, verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, Roman armies. Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Now, file that word desolation in your computer, because I'm going to be using it periodically through the afternoon. Seven times the book of Daniel speaks of desolations. So, mark this one down. And there will be a desolation thereof is near. Verse 21, then 
Now remember who's speaking and who is he speaking to? This is Jesus in his earthly ministry telling this to his people Israel. Then let them who are in the Judea area flee to the mountains. Let them who are in the midst, uh, that is, of Jerusalem, those who are in the midst of it, depart out. Let not them that are in the countries enter therein too, for these be days of vengeance. Now again, file that word. Just put it up in your computer. We're going to talk about it a little later this afternoon. For these are days of vengeance that all things which are written back in the Old Testament prophecies may be fulfilled. Woe unto them that are with child, that is, when this big invasion of Jerusalem takes place, and to them that are nursing in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land of Israel, and wrath upon this people, the Jew. Verse 24, now here's why we know it's not Armageddon, it's not tribulation, it's A.D. 70. And here's the, uh, the kicker. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. That's not going to happen at the end of the seven years. At the end of the seven years, the remnant of Israel will come into the kingdom. But this group of Jews are going to be either killed or dispersed into all the nations. And then here's the part I want you to remember. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until, and what kind of word is that? Time word. There's coming a day when it will be no more, when the Prince of Peace will finally come and Jerusalem will be finally the city of peace and Christ will rule and reign. But until then, the Gentiles are going to control Jerusalem. All right? And it's called then the times of the Gentiles. So here we have from the onset of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire, through the Mede and Emp Medes and Persians, through the Greek, through the Roman, and then after the Roman Empire dissipated and fell away, up comes the Muslim world. See, Muhammad came on about 610 A.D. All right, then from 610 A.D. until after World War I, when the British General Allenby defeated the Muslims who were occupying Palestine at that time, then it became a British mandate. And of those of you who know anything about the uh, war of independence that Israel had to fight, the British army was present. They were the ones that kept everything subdued, trying to keep peace and tranquility, and in their trying to do that, of course, they tried to help the Arabs win that war and did everything they could to see the Jews defeated. But you see, even Great Britain forgot one key player in world affairs, the God of glory. And the God of glory saw to it that the covenant people won that war of independence, and here they are in the news every day. And again, I shared it with my seminars on the road. If ever you have any reason to doubt Scripture, there is one living proof, the Jew. He's in the homeland. He's where he belongs. I don't care how much people fret about it. They are exactly where God wants them to be because, never forget, the whole scenario for the second coming is Jerusalem. And he cannot come to a Jerusalem that's under Muslim control. He's going to come to a Jerusalem that is now occupied by his covenant people. Never lose sight of that. In fact, someone just asked me if, uh, if I would draw a map on the board before we get through with all this of what is the promised land. I don't think I've ever actually drawn the map. I've described it. But you see, the promised land from the day that it was deeded to Abraham repeated to Moses, repeated to Joshua, repeated through the prophets, is all the way from the Nile River. I think I will. I think I'll put it on the board. Okay, all the way. Here we have the Mediterranean Sea. Down here is the Nile River. And then up here, of course, you have Turkey. Now, this is just a caricature. This isn't a map. Okay, but out of Turkey comes the Euphrates River, 
all the way down to the Persian Gulf. Then from the Persian Gulf, it'll go all the way down to the Red Sea and back up to the Nile River. Now here, of course, is the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, the Dead Sea. Here's Jerusalem. Up here is Damascus. Over here is Baghdad. Well, actually, it'd be more like down there. But anyway, that whole Middle East will be Israel's homeland. Let, let's put Baghdad more like down here. Because I remember when we were up here in the Golan Hats, Heights last fall, those of you that were with us remember we saw an arrow pointing Baghdad. How was it, Mom? 300 miles. See, the Middle East is, yeah, it's large, but on the other hand, it's pretty compact. But that's, that's Israel's homeland. They have never had more than just this little neck of land like today, a little bit up here during the time of Solomon and David, but they have never had all of that. But they will, because God has promised it, see? Now, I know a lot of people won't like that, but uh, I'm getting in the habit of doing things that people don't like. I'm getting used to it. So anyway, the times of the Gentiles are... The heavy boots of Gentile armies have been on the streets of Jerusalem since 606 B.C. Now, even since 48, when they declared their independence, they are still under the political thumb, especially of America. They can't do anything without America giving the final okay. Now, while I'm on this, and I think i got time enough, there's always, to me, I have to do it, now come ahead, if you will, to Romans chapter 11. As a rule, I go from Romans 11 to Luke 21. But today I'll go from Luke 21 to Romans 11. And we have another time situation and another filling of things that God has ordained, only it's the very opposite of what you see in Luke. In Luke, we have the iniquity of the Gentiles coming to the full. And when they finally reached the full mark, just like the Canaanites did after the promises made to Abraham. I hope you all remember that. You know, when God first called Abraham out and promised him the nation, he told him that it would be 430 years before his offspring would be able to come in and enjoy the land of Canaan. Well, why wait 430 years? It was going to take that long for the Canaanites to fill their cup of iniquity. Now, if you have any doubts about how wicked and immoral the Canaanite people were at the time of Israel's occupying, you go back and read Leviticus 18. I will never read it in public. I can't because it is so explicit in the immoral behavior of the Canaanite people. They had reached the full mark. See, and that's why God was absolutely just and righteous in telling the Jews to do what with the Canaanite? Oh, we don't even like to say it. But what did he tell them? Don't spare a one of them. Men, women, children, babies. Obliterate them. Well, Israel didn't have the heart. They couldn't do it. And so they left too many Canaanites. And what happened? Exactly what God knew would happen. The Jews embraced the Canaanite idolatrous religion. And it was their downfall. And so God had to indeed deal with the Jew for embracing the Canaanite idolatrous worship. But all right, so we're going to have the same thing now. The world is filling its cup of iniquity. And if you don't know that it's being filled, you're not in the news. You got your head in the sand. I mean, it's awful. And the more we travel and the more we hear, the more we understand how awful the behavior of the people of the world is becoming. But here we have the opposite of that, and that's in Romans 11, verse 25, where Paul has now been laying out so clearly that after the Gentile church age has come to the full, God will return to dealing with his people Israel. He's not through with Israel. Now, we know that even most of Christendom, let alone the rest of the world, now always stop and think. You know, I'm saying that more and more, aren't I? Stop and think. How much of the world is under what we would call biblical or Christian influence? The Orient? Uh-uh. The Middle East? Uh-uh. 
Europe? Uh-uh. South America? Uh-uh. So what's left? America. We're the only part of the world. Now I know there are a lot of Christians in China as a result of the underground church. But by and large, by and large, the whole world outside of our United States of America has almost nothing to do with biblical Christianity. All right. Their wickedness is, to them, not all that unusual because they've been doing it for centuries, but even for them, it's getting worse and worse and worse. All right, but now here in our beloved America, we're seeing a turning away from the Word of God. We're seeing a direct opposition to our Christian message. They hate us, whether you want to admit it or not. But on the other hand, God is filling His cup, which is the body of Christ. And so as every person that gets saved becomes a member of the body of Christ, we're filling our vessel as the world is filling theirs. All right, now I like to depict these two as coming up through the last 2,000 years almost side by side. Now look what this one is. Romans 11, verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, another thing that had never been revealed before, but is now revealed to the Apostle Paul. And this secret, as the other word for mystery, this secret, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, is that blindness, spiritual blindness, for a period of time has happened to Israel, the Jewish people. And that blindness is going to continue, and what's the next word? Until. Until what? The body of Christ is full. Now, it doesn't say that in so many words, but it says the fullness of the Gentiles become in. Now, let me qualify why I know that's the body of Christ. Come back with me to Acts. I guess it's 13 or 15. No, let's see. 15. Acts 15. <clears throat> Acts 15. This is after that Jerusalem council. And Paul and Barnabas have been debating with Peter and John and the rest of the twelve in the Jerusalem church that they were commissioned to go to the Gentiles and the twelve were commissioned to stay with Israel. And so Paul and Barnabas, by God's help, by the Holy Spirit's work, won the argument. All right, now then James, who was moderating that meeting in Jerusalem, he comes to the fore. Verse 13 of Acts 15. <clears throat> So after they had held their peace. Well, what does that mean? Hey, it had been a riotous day. They had been arguing, you know, and I always point out, you know, not to de be deriding the Jewish people. I love them. But on the other hand, I get a kick out of the way they do things. And one of them is when they argue. My, when they argue, there's no punches pulled. They, they go at it tooth and nail. Well, the word indicates that, see? So after they had spent the whole day in arguing and everything, and they finally held their peace. They finally quieted down. James, the moderator, comes up and he says, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simeon, that's Peter. Peter has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles, and that's a reference to the house of Cornelius, to take out of them, now watch your language, to take out of whom? The Gentiles, to take out of the Gentiles a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written, after this, see, after God has called out the body of Christ, and it's full and complete, then he will return, which is a reference to the final seven years and his second coming, We'll build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and so forth. But what I want you to see is that this fullness of the Gentiles is the calling out of the body of Christ, whereas Luke, when he refers to the times of the Gentiles, he's referring to the Gentile world under the headship of these empires that Daniel has been seeing in his prophecies. All right, now then, for just a moment or two left, let's come back to Daniel again, chapter 7. 
where he is reviewing once again these four great Gentile empires. First listed by Nebuchadnezzar as the head of gold, the chest of silver, the belly of brass, the legs of iron. And Daniel saw them as a lion, as a bear, as a leopard, and as something beyond description. All right, now then, for the two minutes we have left, verse 18. But the saints of, <coughs> of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever and ever. <coughs> now, what's that the reference to? Well, the earthly millennial kingdom over which Christ is going to rule and reign. So right here between verse 17 and verse 18, we leap all the way from the time of Daniel in around 500 and some B.C. up to the end time, which we feel we're getting closer and closer with the soon appearance of that man of sin, the son of perdition, the prince that shall come, and all his other names, but best known as the Antichrist. And he's coming. Don't you think for a minute he's not. The whole world is getting ready for him. And that's what we're referring to here in verse 18, is that after the time of these four empires, and I hope I've been making it for the last several tapings, I hope you realize that all four of these empires are now in the news every day because Iran was ancient Persia of the Medes and the Persians. Iraq was ancient Baghdad or Babylon over which Nebuchadnezzar ruled. And then you've got Syria, which is in the news now every day. And Syria was a part of Alexander the Great's empire, which we'll see further on this afternoon. And in the Roman Empire, good heavens, you'd have to have your head in the sand not to realize that the European Union is in the headlines every day. And uh, they are, of course, the revived Roman Empire, which is setting the stage for the second coming of Christ. So here we have the saints that will take the kingdom as a result of Christ's second coming, and they will possess it forever and ever. Now, I haven't got time on 25 seconds, but uh, I think I referred to it several tapings back, that there are two favorite hymns by American church people that have a reference to this verse wrongly. And we'll pick that up in another program. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.